The strategic spaces that will be created will not be by alliances, but by alignments. Right? Uh, alliances will not grow in numbers. They will more or less stay the same. Uh, but alignments are multiplying. Uh, why is that? Because uh, alignments uh, is more flexible, uh, less binding. It does, does not require a treaty. Uh, it can be issues-based. It can change at any time. Uh, and it's easier to sell to the public. Uh, and you can have multiple alignments, uh, which is harder to do with uh, treaty uh, alliances or treaty partnerships. So uh, India, you have strategic autonomy. You can't have alliances, but you are much more aligned to the United States now. Indonesia and India, we have good relations, but now we are aligning much closer to one another. Uh, Philippines is a treaty alliance of the United States, but somehow we see Philippines is getting aligned to China, right? Uh, and you see with Pakistan, uh, we heard today about how the United States has so much presence in Pakistan, but we see Pakistan is getting more and more aligned to uh, China, right? So I think uh, we need to understand that if you are going to understand the strategic landscape in the future, uh, alignments uh, is going to be very much a bigger part of it, and I think more so than alliances. And this is something that China has done exceptionally well. Uh, the second thing is about Indo-Pacific uh, region. I think after the speech by President Trump about the Indo-Pacific, uh, now the world has a buzz again. You know, there's a new life. To, to the word, and in Indonesia, we haven't used the term in, you know, uh, officially in the last three years, but uh, just uh, about a week ago, the foreign minister talked about Indo-Pacific in, uh, in a big way. So uh, the key part about that speech by President Trump is about the Quad, uh, and it's well represented here. But there's something I want to say about this. Uh, I was uh, in China about two weeks ago, uh, and the discussions that I had with the Chinese were that they saw they were not comfortable with the Quad and not also with the national security strategy that was issued by the White House recently. Uh, they thought uh, it had adversarial uh, uh, tone to it. Right? Uh, so I think the key is with the Quad, with the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, how do you present it and walk it in a way that does not create uh, more strategic distrust? Right? Uh, so I think this is an important question. I mean, look, China cannot be Czech. Just in the same way, India cannot be Czech. India is going to keep growing militarily and strategically, just like the United States cannot be Czech, and the, uh, Russia can, cannot be Czech. But the key, in my view, is not how do you check China or the United States or Russia or India, but how do you get them in a strategic framework, an architecture, uh, which is more uh, conducive to cooperation and peace and constructive uh, engagement. And here, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, there are no big ideas. There's a poverty of ideas. If you look at the East Asia Summit, for example, you know, it's going well, they meet every year or so, but they're struggling to get to the next level. Even in my region, ASEAN uh, talks about centrality and coherence, uh, but ASEAN is struggling with a creative idea on uh, you know, this big vision, strategic vision thing uh, the next level after the ASEAN uh, community. So uh, that, that, that is one challenge, uh, but it's not just about how to create big ideas, it's how you get there. Um, the East Asia Summit is one example. Uh, East Asia Summit now is uh, more or less one of the best architecture we have so far for Indo-Pacific, right? 
But if you look at the Asia Summit and how it got there, uh, it is because uh, it was proposed by a middle power like Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, if it was proposed by China, no one will accept it. If it was proposed by the United States, I don't think it would be accepted. It was proposed by Russia or Japan, the others would also reject it, right? But it was pushed by Indonesia, and we engaged India uh, because we didn't want it to be dominated by China. And we got China in, and China was okay, so long as Indonesia was in the driver's seat, and then Russia and the United States joined, right? So that's how East Asia Summit happened as a regional architecture. Uh, and this reveals, I think, an important point. And I'm going to be sorry to be very blunt on this. Uh, what is it? It's called strategic ego, right? Uh, if you're going to quote me one day on this, this is where you heard it first, and you're most welcome. <laughs> but uh, people complain about strategic trust, but there's also such a thing as strategic ego which means if China offers Belt and Road Initiative, the United States start joining it. Why? Because joining it would mean you're accepting China's leadership in the region. And this is the same reason why the United States is not joining the uh, AIIB, because joining it would be accepting uh, China's leadership in, in the region. And the same thing for the Russians with the Eurasian, uh, Eurasian uh, Union. The others have this strategic ego, right? Uh, they're not going to push it because it's not on their own and because, uh, like I said, uh, accepting it would be accepting the other's leadership, right? So we're stuck with this situation whereby, on the one hand, you really need a regional architecture, right? But at the other hand, most of the major powers, or maybe all the major powers, the great powers, cannot make that strategic leap and mindset, right, uh, to... Uh, develop an architecture that is in need of reform, that is in desperate need of greater confidence building and some new type of relationship. I know President Xi Jinping talks about having a new type of great power relationship, uh, obviously talking about the United States and uh, China, but it's still, again, very much lacking in, in, in detail. And we don't know how much China means it 